I'm now a homeowner, and let me tell you, it's awesome, especially now that we're on year two of the pandemic with no real end in sight. But the process of buying a home was an incredibly stressful nightmare. Um, one problem that I found was that there are a lot of houses that have HOAs or homeowners associations, which are formal collectives of homeowners originally established to keep black people out of white neighborhoods, but these days are more concerned with making sure your lawn looks nice. And that was a real problem for me and my partner because there are two things that we both hate more than anything. Someone telling us how to live our own lives and lawns. Okay, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but it's true. I hate a lawn. Um, living in Northern California, we have some water issues. We're often in drought conditions and lawns suck up a huge amount of water. When we finally bought a house and moved in, there was a beautiful green lawn in the back that was kept alive thanks to a vast network of sprinklers that went off every morning and cost quite a bit of money. Um, so that was happening. And then we had to go out and buy a machine to cut the grass because in addition to being in a dry climate, we're also in a high fire zone and long grass is a fire risk. So in exchange for this liquid financial and sweat investment, we got a big green rectangle that our dog likes to poop on sometimes. And the lawn isn't just a bad deal for us, the humans, it's also a bad deal for local wildlife. Lawns take up a bunch of space that could otherwise be used to host native plants. And, you know, I'm not even going to get into the fact that a lot of people who keep lawns use pesticides and other things that can affect the local environment. But just talking about, you know, the space they take up pushing out native plants that's pretty important. Um, and the reason why it's important um, is many fold. One reason why I prefer a native landscape in my backyard is because native plants, by definition, evolved for the environment that I live in. And so by definition, they're going to require a lot less work to keep alive compared to a lawn that doesn't really belong here. But another reason why this is important is because native plants evolved in this area along with native animals, insects particularly. Coevolution is extremely common. It's when two different species exist in the same environment and each influences the evolution of the other in sometimes in like an antagonistic arms race sort of way. One common plant-insect pairing you might know of is that if you want monarch butterflies in your garden, you plant milkweed. Note that you should check what species of milkweed uh, are native to your area, because if you plant the wrong one, you might be doing more harm than good. Just throwing that out there. Check out the links in the description. The uh, But the butterflies lay their eggs on a specific milkweed plant. But that milkweed evolves spiky hairs to dissuade the butterflies from laying their eggs. But that didn't, uh, because the caterpillars that hatch from those eggs evolved the ability to clear the hairs to get to the leaf to feed. But then the milkweed evolves so that when the caterpillar finally bites into it, it gets a mouthful of sticky poison. But then the caterpillar evolved to negate the poison and so on and so on and so on. Uh, it all sounds really annoying for everyone involved, but hey, you know, that's life. And after a hundred million years or so of these adaptations, monarchs and milkweeds are inseparable. It's kind of like those old couples that have been together for 70 years and they've spent so long adapting to one another's specific eccentricities that there's just no way they can ever partner with someone else. Like in the same way that Aunt Doris will never find a partner once Uncle Steve dies, when milkweed goes away, so do the monarchs. And why is that important? Well, because for a start, many of those insects like butterflies and bees are pollinators, so they make things grow. But also there are all these native birds and lizards and things that co-evolve to prey upon these native insects. 
That's right, you're back in the third grade and we're talking about the food web. It's important. Everything is important. It's all connected. I'm thinking about all this right now because now that I have a house and space, I've started gardening and uh, I started growing my own tomato plants from seed and I realized that I had a lot of flowers on the plants that are supposed to magically turn into tomatoes, but it wasn't really happening. And then I remembered bees. So I moved a tomato plant over to a lavender bush where I'd seen a bunch of bees hanging out and bam, tomatoes, exciting. Uh, and it led me to wondering about, you know, what's been happening with the bees over the last few years, you know, with quarantine, is it true? Did nature heal now that like humans aren't out there fucking things up for other species at quite the rate we used to do? Like what happened to all of those bee problems of several years ago? Did quarantine fix that? And it turns out no. No, things are worse than ever. Sorry. So the big news years ago was colony collapse disorder, which is a phenomenon that was observed in certain honeybee populations over the past few decades. A significant percentage of honeybees suddenly mysteriously died off. And the weird thing is that after all this time, scientists are still not totally sure why. Could be pesticides, could be parasites, could be global warming. It could be all of those things together and more. And if it continues, yes, it could be bad for humans due to the fact that honeybees are responsible for pollinating about 75% of all plants used for human consumption worldwide. That said, that's not necessarily the bee issue you should worry about. That's right. There's more than one bee issue to worry about. And in fact, there's more than one bee to worry about. You see, honeybees encompass just a handful of the more than 20,000 known species of bee. And they aren't even native to the United States. They're actually Eurasian. Accordingly, here in the United States, we don't need any honeybees to survive just fine. Honeybees are used in agriculture because unlike the milkweed monarch example, they aren't picky about what they pollinate. They're generalists. You can take a hive of honeybees to a field of almonds, let them out, and they'll be like, oh, cool, today it's almonds. <laughs> Whatever, man. And they go to work. Generalists. Today, almonds tomorrow, strawberries, whatever. If farmers didn't have honeybees, the native bees could fill in some niches where appropriate, but not as easily on a mass industrial scale. Native bees, like bumblebees, tend to be solitary and picky. They're specialists. They have the one plant that they grew up with and that's what they would prefer to fertilize. So because of that, it's much harder to put them to work for humans. That said, if you are growing the plants that these native bees co-evolved with, then they're probably going to do a better job than the honeybee generalists at pollinating them. So the real problem isn't just the ongoing mysterious die-off of non-native honeybees used in commercial agriculture, an industry that has about a thousand other possibly more pressing sustainability issues to deal with, it's the corresponding die-off of native bees. And that one isn't quite as mysterious as colony collapse. It's most likely due to loss of habitat and pesticides. I could tie this all together very neatly by highlighting the small scale, like too many lawns. Uh, but let's be honest, the lawns are bad, but it's really industrialization in general that has destroyed vast swaths of native habitat for bumblebees. And not just paved over post-paradise parking lots, but also industrial monoculture farmland where a single crop takes over acres and acres of land, making wild bees sad because no one wants to eat nothing but corn for the rest of your life even if the rest of your life is only like three more months. And unfortunately, the wild bee population hasn't been doing great. In January, researchers from the Pollination Ecology Group at the Institute for Research on Biodiversity and the Environment published this kind of depressing news that since 1990, bee species worldwide have declined by about 25%. 
They found this by examining the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which has gathered data from museums and field op- observations from 1946 to the present day. Of course, that data isn't perfect. We can assume that uh, as the decades pass, humans got better and better at logging this kind of data, which kind of makes the finding even worse because, you know, right now we have more data today than we ever have before, but we're finding fewer and fewer species of bee. And remember, thanks to coevolution, there's a chance that if we lose a specific species of bee, we might also be losing a corresponding plant. But there is a new study that offers a bit of hope. Matthew Sarver, an ecologist at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, conducted a survey of the native bees found at that center's gardens. For two years, he collected nearly 3,500 bees from 135 different species found across three of the center's areas, two of which were natural and one of which was a cultivated garden. He found 15 species that were never before found in Delaware, including one threatened species that hasn't been seen within hundreds of miles of that area. The biggest discovery, though, was that the largest diversity of bee species they found wasn't in those two wild areas. It was in the cultivated garden where they had specifically planted native species that would bloom year round. Uh, which attracted specialist bees that came and pollinated them. Usually when I talk about environmental issues like global warming, I take pains to note that the problems are created largely by these big industries and must ultimately be solved by regulating those industries. Individual actions like recycling your aluminum cans or biking to work instead of driving, those can be great for the environment, but the issue is much, much bigger than what individual action can solve alone, which is a little depressing, I understand. But in this case, this study specifically offers a solution that you can contribute to. Sarver spoke to the Washington Post saying, these are very small animals. You don't need a hundred acres to make an impact. A tiny bee can do well in a small residential setting. It's a great opportunity for conserving biodiversity, but enough of us have to do it. I'll be honest, rewilding my lawn has not been the easiest thing. There is a lot of conflicting advice out there on the best way to do it. I did a bunch of research and found a lot of experts that said, the way to go is sheet mulching. Um, you know, you put down cardboard and then compost and mulch, you know, it kills your lawn and makes your soil rich. But then it was like really hard for me to figure out, well, which layer goes first and how much of each should I do? And, um, which mulch is going to be best for the yard and for the plants and for fire resistance. And then once I decided on a plan and went to work, only then did a friend point me towards another expert who says, actually, sheet mulching isn't the best thing after all, which honestly just really depressed me because Jesus Christ, like I'm trying, I did the research and it's still so hard. But reading this study has kind of renewed my my spirit, my enthusiasm. Like maybe I'm not going to do it perfectly, but at the end of the day, or by the end of next spring, I guess, um, my backyard space is going to be at least a, a little better for the environment than I found it. And in a time that feels like I'm just helplessly watching as things in the world get worse and worse, I think I could really use the knowledge that I, as an individual, can do this small thing to make a real, noticeable, positive impact on the planet. So I hope you'll join me in this. If you have a yard, um, I've linked to resources in the transcript. You can find the link in the doobly-doo. Um, even if you don't have a yard, you can set up a space on a balcony or in a window that can still help native pollinators. So information is below, uh, check it out. And I, I hope that this brings a little bit of optimism <laughs> into an otherwise kind of bleak time.